Okay, thank you everybody for joining us again uh, for our third week of What's Next, Purpose, Power, and Presence Through Pandemic. And so we're really excited about this. I mean, I was really, uh, had planned to just kind of take a hiatus for the summer, but felt led to uh, discuss some of these uh, issues as we're sort of emerging from sort of a, a year and a half uh, scenario. Uh, that none of us could have imagined. And uh, I thought I wanted to, I think it would be good for me personally and for those uh, that I'm connected to, to really uh, kind of review some of these, uh, these issues uh, that I think are, are constant uh, in, in the Christian life, uh, purpose, power, presence. Uh, these, these are with us uh, wherever we are. Uh, and none of us could have imagined that we would have been in the situation that we're in now. Uh, but I thank God that God is still available, God's presence, uh, God's power is available, and, and God has still invested each and every one of us, us with a purpose and, and the power to fulfill uh, of that purpose. And so, uh, so we're excited that uh, you're able to join us uh, uh, for tonight. Uh, we won't hold you long, but we do have uh, something specific to share uh, with you on tonight around, mostly around the issue of presence. Okay, and so if we could just, uh, I'd like to go back to the last week since all of these issues, uh, purpose, power, and presence are really interconnected. And so I, I wanna kind of just do a little brief review of what we discussed on last week and then we'll jump right into uh, the issue of presence. On last year, last, I'm sorry, last uh, week, uh, our, our key scripture was Acts chapter one verses four uh, through 11. Uh, that was our, our second week. And um, uh, these are the three points on your left are kind of like three of the primary points that we made uh, during last week's uh, study. Uh, and our first point was simply that while God has invested everyone with purpose, we need power to fulfill our purpose, right? And so we, we talked about, you know, Adam and Eve, uh, how, how God had put purpose in them, but God blessed them, he created them, but then he blessed them, said, be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and subdue it and so on. Uh, so God invested them with purpose, but gave them the power to actually enact that, that purpose. Our second point was that uh, power to fulfill, fulfill purpose comes from the gift of the Holy Spirit, right? So we're speaking, when we talk about power in, in the context that we've been uh, uh, t speaking of, we've been talking about the, the power of the Holy Spirit, right? And so uh, that, that spirit uh, came upon the apostles uh, uh, so that they could go out into the world and be witnesses, right? In Jerusalem, uh, in Judea, in Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Uh, but they received power in order to be those witnesses uh, to, to Jesus Christ uh, to the ends of the earth, right? And so we're talking about the, the gift of the Holy Spirit that empowers us uh, to fulfill our purpose. And then finally, we made a point about unity. Uh, and that was simply that the power of unity is central to the fulfillment of purpose. And I, I, yes, last, last week, I really talked about uh, this idea that uh, the gift uh, uh, that God gives us is really unity. That there's so much power just in unity itself. And, and that, uh, you know, you take three chords and put them together, uh, it's, 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 it gets kind of hard. To, the more chords that you put together, the harder, it, harder they are to break, right? One, you may be able to break easily, but you keep putting chords together. And uh, a three-stranded chord is not easily uh, uh, broken, right? And so there's so one, one could chase a thousand, two can put 10,000 to flight, right? So, so our, our, the power that we have is magnified uh, when we come together. And that is really a gift to us. And a lot of times we're looking for a demonstrative move of God uh, uh, in, in some sort of huge miraculous manifestation. And I think uh, the, the word that comes from God is that, you know, I've already given you so much power. And, and some of that power, I believe, is, is, in, is in unity. On the right side of your screen, I just have three uh, of the uh, key scriptures uh, that we that we discuss, uh, we had a lot of scriptures. We ha had a whole page of them, but these are uh, three refreshers. First Corinthians six and fourteen says, "And God raised the Lord, and will also raise us up by His power." Ephesians six and ten. Uh, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. 
and then Ephesians 3 and 20. Now to him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that works in us. Those are three very good scriptures uh, to meditate on as we think about uh, as we think about uh, power. Uh, okay, so that's our that's our little refresher uh, from last week. Uh, let us let us jump into uh, this issue of 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 uh, presence. Presence. And if you can see your screen here, uh, uh, this is kind of our little table of contents. Uh, uh, we're going to talk about uh, presence in. Psalm 139, which is our key scripture for this evening, Psalm 139. Uh, then we'll talk a little bit about presence in biblical perspective. Uh, thirdly, we'll, we'll address the issue of presence in the revelation of Jesus Christ. And then finally, uh, we'll review some scriptures that you can jot down uh, on, on presence, what the Bible says about, about presence. Okay, everybody on the same page. All right. Okay, so here's here's our our key scripture uh, for today. Psalm one thirty nine one through fourteen. O Lord, you have searched me and known me. You know my sitting down and my rising up. You understand my thought afar off. You comprehend my path and my lying down and are acquainted with all my ways. For there is not a word on my tongue, but behold, O Lord, you know it all together. You have hedged me behind and before and laid your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is high. I cannot attain it. Where can I go from your spirit? Or where can I flee from your presence? If I ascend into heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in hell, behold, you are there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there your hand shall lead me and your right hand shall hold me. If I say, surely the darkness shall fall on me, even the night shall be light about me. Indeed, the darkness shall not hide from you, but the night shines as the day. The darkness and the light are both alike to you. For you formed my inward parts. You covered me in my mother's womb. I will praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. That is, a, that is an awesome, it's a beautiful and powerful a passage of scripture, uh, and there, there's so much there for us to, uh, to contemplate. We're just going to scratch the surface on, on tonight, but I do want to sort of raise a, a few points uh, about presence in Psalm 139. So uh, I, you can remember when we started off, uh, our, our key uh, verse was Psalm 23 when we started this session out, and both Psalm 139 and Psalm 23 are attributed to David. The two Psalms highlight the omnipresence and manifest presence of God, right? And so when we talk about omnipresence of God, we're simply talking about the fact that, that, that God is present everywhere, right? Omnipresent. But when we talk about manifest presence, I think we're, we're going into the issue of the ways in which we discern the presence of God. So, so some God is present, but not everybody's aware of it, right? That, is that right? So, so if we let's let's think about for for one moment, let's go to the prodigal son, the lost son who who's at at that point he's in a far country. He had gotten his inheritance. He he left his father's home and he had uh, spent all of his money. He joins himself to a farmer in a distant country, and he's ready to eat from the pig's trough. I mean, he's gone, right? He's he's and but but it, it says it says that he he has this. He came to himself. It seemed like for a moment, at least, he was detached from, from the manifest presence of God. God was present there at the pig trough, right? But he was not aware uh, as, the, as the ways in which we discern God's presence. And to say he came to himself, right? So he was, there was an awareness of the presence of God. And he said, wait, how many, how many of, 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 of 
the ser servants are in my father's house and they have bread to eat and even to spare is the ways in which we are aware of God's, the Father's presence in our in our situation, wherever that situation is, right? If it's in a if it's in a positive situation or if it's in a negative situation, if it's at the big trough, if it's in a if it's in a pandemic, the ways in which we discern God's presence. He, he came to himself and he says, I'll, I'll, I'll get up, I'll go to my father, and I'll say, Father, I've sinned against you, I've sinned against heaven, I am no longer worthy to be your son. Make me like one of your slaves. So it's that awareness. Of, of God's presence. Yes, the manifest presence. So in Psalm 23, the divine shepherd is, is with David in favorable moments, i.e. in green pastures and beside still waters, right? The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want, right? He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside still waters. So, so David is acknowledging that God is with me in those in those wonderful spaces in life that we have, those positive moments, those those high times in life that we that we always cherish, that that God is God is not 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 just that God is with me, but in fact that God is actually leading me to these places. Yes, that's the manifest presence. Yeah, it's a, but God is also with David though. And that's why I love the Psalms because we get these contrasts and and. and in view of the contrast, we have the permanence of God, right? So it doesn't matter, you know, wh whether you're beside still waters or in green pastures or you're traversing the valley of the shadow of death. David acknowledges that God is even with him in the valley of the shadow of death. God's presence is discernible as God provides comfort and provision even in a hard place, right? even in the, the valley of the shadow of death. I'll fear no evil, right? For thou art what? With me. We're talking about presence tonight. Thy rod and thy staff, they what? They comfort me. So even, even, in, a, even in a dark place, David acknowledges not just the present, not that just God is everywhere, but that God is, God is actually in my situation, working it out for me, right? God's presence is available and it's active and there's agency there uh, in, in a way uh, to deliver me. This, this is what David is really saying. So, so similarly in, in Psalm 139, David acknowledges God's omnipresence and manifest presence, yes? So here it says here uh, uh, in, in Psalm 139, where can I go from your spirit? I love this. Or where can I flee from your presence? If I ascend into heaven, you are there. Look at the contrast. If I make my bed in where? In hell. <laughs> Behold, you are there. Oh my, my. So, so, so God covers the whole gamut. So it doesn't matter. In, in, in some sense, in some sense, it doesn't really matter where we are. God covers the gamut between heaven and hell. I mean, we could be at our worst on our worst day ever imaginable. And, and they would, according to David, he's saying, he, you're, you, he said, if I make my bed in hell, like, like I'm, I might be here for a while. <laughs> you are there. Yes. Now, an important revelation from Psalm 23 and Psalm 139 is the active presence of God. This is what I want you to get tonight. It is the active presence of God leading right? Leadeth me beside the still waters, right? Leading, restoring, thou restore my soul, preparing, preparing a table before me in the presence of my enemies, comforting and holding. This is, this is an active presence, yes? So, so God is not just kind of passive here, uh, sort of watching us uh, go through situations. God is leading, he's restoring, he's preparing, he's comforting, he's holding, and, and, and a pandemic is not so bad that God can't intervene in these types of ways, in restoration, in comforting, in holding, in leading, in restoring, in healing. God is present even in this, yes? The psalmist says, if I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there your hand shall lead me. 
Can you just imagine, imagine the picture where God is just holding us by the hand. <laughs> did, you, did your parent ever hold your hand when you were going to kindergarten? Your mom on your first day of school, holding your hand while you go to the bus, you do not want to go. You, I did not want to leave. I'm trying to tell you right now. I, I cried so much, in fact, that I thought they sent me home. I, I had to stay home a whole year. And for years, I thought I had to stay home because I cried so much. Now, it was, you know, my birthday fell on a certain date, so I had to, I had to go with the next class of students. But for years, I thought I cut up so bad. They said, you, it, we're going to send you right back to your mom. She can hold your hand for another year. Bless God. If, if I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there your hand shall lead me your right hand shall hold me. Do you see the intimacy that David portrays? That, that God is not just present, God is actively involved in my life in the way of redemption, in the way of renewal, in the way of life, uh, in the way of restoration. This is, this is what the presence of God, this is what it's really all about. And it, it's, really in, it's really in these, uh, these two Psalms, Psalm 23 and Psalm uh, one. Uh, 139. Okay. So if we if we do kind of, if you did like a sort of a side by side, uh, a sort of an, a, a brief analysis of, of these two psalms, you could you could kind of see the similarities here. On, on the left side of your screen, you have Psalm 23, and then on the right side of your screen, you have Psalm 139. Right. And so I, I'm not going to go over this. We, but I just I do want to point out. You know, uh, in the Psalms, both open up kind of similarly. Uh, in Psalm 23, it says, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Right? In, in, in Psalm 130, oh, Lord, you have searched me and known me. So, so right off the bat, we kind of get this sort of this intimacy uh, between David and God, right? So, so intimacy in terms of if we think of a, a, a shepherd and, and, and the flock, right? The sheep know the shepherd's voice. They won't even respond to a stranger. There's this intimacy, this closeness. Uh, and the, 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 the shepherd can call the sheep by name. Yes? And, and so, and so, and it's, a, it's the same way for Psalm 139. It, it says, oh, Lord, you have searched me and, and know me. You know my sitting down and my rising up. You, you know me like, like, a, like a, sh a shepherd would know, would know its sheep. Intimately known in this, in, in this sense, right? And so, uh, uh, and so, if we if we skip down, I'll uh, just skip down to verse four. Uh, can y'all see my cursor here, right here? It says, uh, "Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me; thy rod and thy staff, uh, they comfort me." So, so four, verse four in Psalm twenty three is is like is like verse eight in Psalm one thirty nine. He says, if I ascend into heaven, you are there. And he says, if I make my bed in, do you see the similarity? If I make my bed in hell, hell is the, is the valley of the shadow of death, yes? He says, if I make my bed in hell, behold, you are there. And so you, you have God that is active. It doesn't matter, God, the activity, the presence of God is not hindered by our, our scenario, by our situation, by where we are. God's presence is still available to us in very, in very intimate and, and critical ways. Yes. And then um, uh, I, I think I wanted to point out uh, uh, one more, one more uh, point here. I think it's uh, uh, verse 10. It says, even there your hand shall, if I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there your hand shall lead me and your right hand shall hold me. Uh, and then here it says in verse six in Psalm 23, surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. I will dwell on the house of the Lord forever. And in, in, in verse 5, 2, thou preparest a table before me in the presence of my enemies. Thou anointed my head with oil, my cup runneth over. We, we, we get in both of these psalms the, the active presence of God uh, in a way, in a way that, that delivers us, that protects us, that keeps us, that nourishes us. And so the whole point of this study. Uh, when we talk about, you know, purpose, power, and presence through pandemic, is just to really encourage us to know that, that God is with us, even through pandemic, right? God, God is, and not just, you know, God is not just 
trans, I'm not talking about just a transcendent God. I'm talking about imminent God that is imminent, that is present, that is in our situation and it is available to us in all of these ways, comforting, leading, holding our hand, guiding us, anointing us, uh, you know, uh, you know, chasing us with goodness and, and, and mercy. And, and that's, that's the God that we're, that, that we're, that we serve. And, and so um, let me move on to the, to the next screen. Okay, so let us, let us uh, briefly, let's talk about, uh, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to go, let me go back. I'm trying to navigate this, uh, I have your, your faces on the screen, so I'm trying to navigate uh, that around, around the text. So I wanna talk a little bit about presence in, uh, in biblical perspective presence in biblical perspective and then and then and then we're almost we're almost done so so listen up this is the book ends to the sacred story or the presence of god if we if we kind of look at the bible in in grand scope uh you know one book in like in the beginning uh we get the presence of god in genesis and the, the other book in uh in in revelation we get the same thing we get the presence of god right on, uh, on both ends, on, on the one hand, God's spirit hovers over the primeval waters before God speaks creation into being. We went over this, right? Genesis uh, chapter one, verses one and two. Ultimately, God, God created human beings in his image and likeness and blessed them to fulfill their purpose, right? Now, concerning the other book in, this is the, the book in on the Revelation side. Heaven collides with the whole earth to make a perfect sanctuary for God to dwell with humanity. Did y'all did y'all get that? Did you get it? Heaven collides with the whole earth to make a perfect sanctuary for God to dwell with humanity. Now this is this is the way this is the way John writes it uh, as as he's in exile uh, on on the on the uh, island of Patmos. He says, "Now I saw." A new heaven and a new earth. This is the this is the other book in. Think about it in the context of, of, of Genesis. Now I saw or Eden, that, that Garden of Eden, that perfect resplendent place that God had created for communion uh, with, with the people that God created. Yes. He says, Now I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. And I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, behold, the tabernacle of God is with men and he will dwell with them and they shall be his people. God himself will be with them and be their God and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There shall be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying. Look at the bookends to the story. This is a powerful story. There's no story like this one. Yeah. Yeah. So, so God, 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 there's pre God's presence in the very beginning of the story and this orchestrated presence. God created a, a, a perfect space for Adam and Eve. And God is in that space with, with Adam and Eve. Yes. And, and Adam and Eve, they, they felt, they fell off, off the wagon and, and we, we know how the story goes from there, but, but in, at the other end of the story, on the, on the other side of the story, we still see God who has, who has created this, this perfect reality to dwell, to, to dwell with us. Presence, right? It's, it's about God. It's about God dwelling with us. Yes? Let me uh, I'll let someone into the room here and then I'll just, okay, we'll go on. So, so, so those, those, are, those are the bookends to this, to this wonderful narrative that, that, we, that we all have a role to play. Right? We have a purpose in this thing. And God has invested us with purpose. He's given us power to fulfill purpose. And he's, a, he's promised to be with us always. His presence is with us no matter where we are. Irrespective of where we are, God, God is, is, is with us. And so uh, I, I could go on a little bit more about this, but I, I, I want somebody to underline it. God himself will be with them and be their God. Are you following me? This is what God, and God will wipe away every tear. Now, now, I, 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 want, I don't know who this is for tonight, but I want, I want you to get the reality 
that God's presence is enough to dry your tears right here. <laughs> it's enough. I mean, we, we don't have to wait. We don't, we don't have to wait for heaven. God, God's presence is enough. What does is, what is, what is, what is the apostle Paul say? He says, your grace is, is what he says, is sufficient. That God's presence is so overwhelming and so great and so magnanimous that, that God can wipe away our tears. He, he, he can take care of it right now. He can take care of our sorrow, our, our uncertainty, our depression, our anxiety. God's presence, it's enough. It's enough for us right here, right here in Maryland, in Pennsylvania, wherever we are, in Philadelphia, it's, it's, it's enough, yes? Then now the narrative between these bookends, listen at this, the narrative between, we're talking about between the bookends now, details the interaction between God's presence and humanity. Look at the way the story goes. So we have these bookends, God's presence is on either side. But if we read the story from Genesis to Revelation, what we really get is a detailed account of the ways in which God is present, is active in the life of the world. Yes? So, so, so it's, really about, it's really about the Bible. Well, you could almost summarize it. Uh, and, and say that the Bible is really about the ways in which God is active in the life of the world. That God is present. And we, what we have to do, even as, even as seasoned Christians, we have to remind ourselves, I don't, you know, we have to remind ourselves that God is with us. Because sometimes, unless you, unless you super deep, sometimes it feels like God is not with us. Sometimes it feels like God is far. What did Jesus say on the cross? This is God's own son. God, my God, why hast thou <laughs> forsaken me? Are you, are you with me? So sometimes it can feel like, it, it, it can feel, and so we have to remind ourselves that, and that's why, that's why scripture, that's why, that's why, you know, if you're feeling like God is far from you and you need a reminder and you need a reminder that God is near, you just go back, you just go on back and you go on back and you read, you read the story. You, you, read, you read the story. What, is, what does it say? Where, where can I flee from your presence? Where can I go from your spirit? If I ascend into heaven, you're there. Are you with me? Sometimes, sometimes, sometimes we, just gotta we just gotta read the story. If I make my bed in hell, behold, you're there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there your hand shall lead me. And so sometimes we just need to remind ourselves, wherever we are, that God is with us, that he's with us. We can't, we can't, we can't get so far that God, even at the pig's trough, <laughs> God is at the lowest, spent all of our money, did everything that I was big and bad enough to do. And now I'm sitting here ready to eat from the pig's trough. But God, even there, he's there. He's there. I, I could end this. I could end this thing right now, but I think I have a couple more. I have a couple more slides. So let's let's go. Let's let's finish it up. So this this slide here is really about uh, God's presence through covenants. So we want to look at the ways, the specific ways that God is active uh, in, in in the world, in 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 community, with with a people. Uh, we can look at we can look at covenants, and we're not going to go through all of these. But I did I did want to put them up. If you wanted to jot some of those down, it says through a series of covenants: Adamic covenant, um, Mosaic, Noahic, Abrahamic, Davidic, the New Covenant. We see how God's presence is actively interwoven into the fabric of the human story, right? And so the Edenic co covenant. Uh, the covenant in Eden, then God blessed them, the scripture says, and God said to them, be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and subdue it, have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. That's in Genesis 1, uh, uh, chapter 1, verses 28 through 30. And, and I want to remind you that, that God just doesn't, this is God, God blessed them, right? God gave them the, the capacity. God entered into an arrangement with, with Adam and Eve, yes? And so we go to the Noah covenant. It says, thus I establish my covenant with you. Never again shall all flesh 
be cut off by the waters of the flood. Never again shall there be a flood to destroy the earth. Uh, Genesis 9 and 11. And we know uh, the Abrahamic covenant. Uh, I will, in Genesis 12, I will make you a great nation. This is to Abraham. I will bless you and make your name great, and you shall be a blessing. In you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Now, this, I want you to, what I want you to see here is that the ways that, that God is, God is intentional about, in, in God's dealings with us. God is intentional in, in terms of God's presence, the manifestation of God's presence. These are covenants, yes? These are, these, are all, these, are, these are arrangements that God makes with humanity, the Mosaic covenant. Now, therefore, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, then you shall be a special treasure to me above all people, for all the earth is mine, and you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation, Exodus 19, 5 and 6. And then the new covenant. New Covenant, Jeremiah 31, 31 and 34. Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. I will put my law in their minds and write it on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. This is getting good. This is getting good because when we look, when we talk about the new covenant, uh, you know, we make the argument that the fulfillment of the new covenant is in the person of Jesus Christ. Right? The word was made what? Flesh. It is the enfleshment of, of God in our reality in real time. Yes, it is God made present, God Emmanuel, God with us. Yes. And so the new covenant is inaugurated through the birth, life, ministry, death, and resurrection of God's Son. Jesus Christ. Jesus said himself in the final Passover meal with his disciples, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is shed for you. Hebrews 9 and 22 records it this way. Indeed, under the law, almost everything is purified with blood. And without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. Now, 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 the covenant now, Jesus Christ is the mediator of this new covenant. Are you, you follow, follow the story. Follow the story. That Jesus Christ is, 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 the, is the Lamb of God who offered up his own life, who shed his own blood. Without, without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. Who offered up his own life, who shed his own blood, for the forgiveness, for the remission of the sins of the whole world. Are you following it? So it is Jesus, the Lamb of God, offered up his own life. He shed his own blood for the remission of the sins of the world. Now, here's, here's, here's what I want to get to. Here's what I want to get to. I mean, this is all about, this is, I mean, it's all there. I mean, you know, atonement is in Genesis. This is there, right? Genesis 3.21, where, you know, God covered Adam and Eve. God covered their shame with garments of animal skin. There's sacrifice right there. But in the fullness of time, God sends the perfect sacrifice in Jesus Christ, yes, who went all the way to Calvary, who gave up his own. This is greater love hath no man than this, than, than, than a man would lay down his life for his friends. He laid God. Jesus laid down his life for us. Yes, he united us with God. He atoned for, for our sins. Now, the reason why the revelation of God's presence in Jesus Christ in the realm of human history is so important is because we can model our own lives after the example Jesus left us. So we're not, we're not, we're not down here trying to figure out how to get close to God. God came to us in Jesus Christ. God revealed God's self in Jesus Christ. God, God revealed God's self in Jesus Christ, who, who preached on the kingdom of God, who lived the kingdom of God, who taught us how to love and how to forgive, and who, who taught us how to, how to minister and reach out to the dying and the lost and all of these things. So we, we have, a, we have a, a, an example, yes? This is very important. And then following Jesus, we know that we are what? We're never alone. 
that God is always with us. In our moments of agony, God is with us at Calvary. God is with us in, in, in the distressing moments of life and through pandemic. And God is with us in seasons of triumph. That's what we, that's what we, that's what we know. That's what the story tells us, that, that God, God, Jesus said, he said, I'm with you always. Lo, I'm with you always. And then, and then even more, even after Jesus ascended to heaven, even, even in, in the light of his ascension, Jesus said, he said that to told his disciples, it is to your advantage that I go away. Because I'm going to send you a comforter, an advocate. I'm going, so I'm just not going to leave you alone. That's, my, that's another manifestation of my presence. Even still, yes. So God is God is with us. God is with us. And in, in following, in following the template set by Jesus Christ, God's Son Jesus Christ, John 3:16 says what says it says it best. For God so loved the world that he what? That he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God did not send his son into, into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Now, if we follow that template, listen to me, our nearness to God is in following the model that Jesus set. If we, if we follow the model that Jesus set, that is how we are made near to God. We experience his presence, no doubt about it. When we follow Jesus, when we follow after Jesus, we're, we're near to God. When we, follow, when we really follow with our whole hearts, that's, that's why the scripture says, hide the word in your heart that you might not what? sin against God. Our nearness, our nearness to God is through our relationship with the mediator of this new covenant. Jesus says it best when he says, listen, he says in, in John 14 and 6, and I'm finished right here, in John 14 and 6, he said, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If we want to experience nearness to God, get in a relationship with God's son, Jesus Christ, and there's enough power in that relationship to, to save us from, from any distress, including pandemic, yeah? Including pandemic. Including pandemic. And so that, that's, that's what we, that's our hope. That's our blessed hope uh, as, as the disciples of Jesus Christ, as God's children, that, that, that God is with us, that God has invested us with purpose, that God has given us power to fulfill that purpose. And, and our purpose in God's presence and God's power will never be undone by a pandemic, will never be undone by the valley of the shadow of death, will never be done, undone by, by, by the gates of hell. Is, is, and that what, Jesus, what did Jesus say? He said, on this rock, I build my what? Church. He said, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it, will not prevail against it. Amen.